Chapter 5 The tragedy had occurred when Kitty was 13 years old. It was high summer. There was no school. The sun shone on the terrace tops, birds trilled, light spilled into the house. Her father hummed as he stood before the mirror, adjusting his tie. Her mother left her an iced bun for her breakfast, waiting in the fridge. Jacob had called on Kitty early. She opened the door to find him flourishing his bat. Cricket, he said. It's perfect for it. We can go to the posh park. Everyone will be at work, so there'll be no one there to clear us out. All right, Kitty said. But I'm batting. Wait till I get my shoes. The park stretched to the west of Balham, away from the factories and shops. It began as a rough area of waste ground, covered with bricks, thistles, and old rusted sections of barbed wire. Jacob and Kitty, and many other children, played here regularly. But if you followed the ground west, and clambered over an old metal bridge above a railway, you found the park becoming increasingly pleasant, with spreading beech trees, shady walks, and lakes where wild ducks swam, all dotted across a great sward of smooth green grass. Beyond was a wide road, where a row of large houses, hidden by high walls, marked the presence of magicians. Commoners were not encouraged to enter the pleasant side of the park. Stories were told in the playgrounds of children who had gone there for a dare, and never come back. Kitty did not exactly believe these tales, and she and Jacob had once or twice crossed the metal bridge and ventured out as far as the lakes. On one occasion, a well-dressed gentleman with a long black beard had shouted at them across the water, to which Jacob responded with an eloquent gesture. The gentleman himself did not appear to respond, but his companion, whom they had not previously observed, a person very short and indistinct, had set off running round the side of the lake towards them with surprising haste. Kitty and Jacob had only just made good their escape. But usually, when they looked across the railway line, the forbidden side of the park was empty. It was a shame to let it go to waste, especially on such a delightful day when all magicians would be at work. Kitty and Jacob made their way there at good speed. Their heels drummed on the tarmac surface of the metal bridge. No one about, Jacob said. Told you. Is that someone? Kitty shielded her eyes and peered out towards a circle of beaches, partly obscured by the bright sun. By that tree. I can't quite make it out. Where? No, it's just shadows. If you're chicken, we'll go over by that wall. It'll hide us from the houses across the road. He ran across the path and onto the thick green grass, bouncing the ball skillfully on the flat surface of the bat as he went. Kitty followed with more caution. A high brick wall bounded the opposite side of the park. Beyond it lay the broad avenue, studded with magicians' mansions. It was true that the center of the grass was uncomfortably exposed, overlooked by the black windows of the house's upper stories. It was also true that if they hugged close to the wall, it would shield them from this view. But this meant crossing the whole breadth of the park, far from the metal bridge, which Kitty thought unwise. But it was a lovely day, and there was no one about, and she let herself run after Jacob, feeling the breeze drift against her limbs, enjoying the expanse of blue sky. Jacob came to a halt a few meters from the wall beside a silver drinking fountain. He tossed the ball into the air and, Whacked it straight up to an almighty height. Here'll do, he said, as he waited for the ball to return. This is the stumps. I'm in bat. You promise me. Whose bat is it? Whose ball? Despite Kitty's protests, natural law prevailed, and Jacob took up position in front of the drinking fountain. Kitty walked a little way off, rubbing the ball against her shorts in the way that bowlers did. She turned and looked towards Jacob with narrow, appraising eyes. He tapped the bat against the grass, grinned inanely, and wiggled his bottom in an insulting manner. She began the run-up, slowly at first, then building up pace, ball cupped in hand. Jacob tapped the ground. Kitty swung her arm up and over, loosed the delivery at demonic speed. 
It bounced against the tarmac of the path, shot up toward the drinking fountain. Jacob swung the bat, made perfect contact. The ball disappeared over Kitty's head, high, high into the air, so that it became nothing but a dot against the sky, and finally fell to earth halfway back across the park. Jacob did a dance of triumph. Kitty considered him grimly. With a heavy, heartfelt sigh, she began the long trudge to retrieve the ball. Ten minutes later, Kitty had bowled five balls and made five excursions to the other side of the park. The sun beat down. She was hot, sweaty, and irate. Returning at last with dragging steps, she pointedly tossed the ball on the grass and flopped herself down after it. Bit knackered? Jacob asked considerately. You almost got the last one. A sarcastic grunt was the only reply. He proffered the bat. You go, then. In a minute. For a time, they sat in silence, watching the leaves moving on the trees, listening to the sound of occasional cars from beyond the wall. A large flock of crows flew raucously across the park and settled in a distant oak. Good job my grandmama's not here, Jacob observed. She wouldn't like that. What? Those crows. Why not? Kitty had always been a little scared of Jacob's grandmama, a tiny, wizened creature with little black eyes and an impossibly wrinkled face. She never left her chair in the warm spot of the kitchen and smelled heavily of paprika and pickled cabbage. Jacob claimed she was a hundred and two years old. He flicked a beetle off a grass stalk. She'd reckon they were spirits, servants of the magicians. That's one of their preferred forms, according to her. It's all stuff she learned from her mum, who came over from Prague. She hates windows being left open at night, no matter how hot it gets. He put on an aged, quivering voice. Close it up, boy. It lets the demons in. She's full of things like that. Kitty frowned. You don't believe in demons, then? Of course I do. How else do you think the magicians get their power? It's all in the spell books they send over to get bound or printed. That's what magic is all about. The magicians sell their souls, and the demons help them in return. If they get the spells right. If they don't, the demons kill them dead. Who'd be a magician? I wouldn't, for all their jewels. For a few minutes, Kitty lay silently on her back, watching the clouds. A thought occurred to her. So, let me get this right, she began. If your dad and his dad before him have always worked on spell books for magicians, they must have read a lot of the spells, right? So that means, I can see where you're going with this. Yeah, they must have seen stuff, enough to know to keep well clear of it anyway. But a lot of it's written in weird languages, and you need more than just the words. I think there are things to draw and potions and all sorts of horrid extras to learn if you're going to master demons. It's not something anybody decent wants to be part of. My dad just keeps his head down and makes the books. He sighed. Mind you, people have always assumed my family are in on it all. After the magicians fell from power in Prague, one of my grandpa's uncles was chased by a mob and thrown from a high window. Landed on a roof and died. Grandpa came to England soon after and started the business again. It was safer for him here. Anyway... He sat up, stretched. Whether those crows are demons, I very much doubt. What would they be doing sitting in a tree? Come on. He tossed her the bat. Your turn. And I bet I get you out first ball. To Kitty's vast frustration, this was exactly what he did. And the next time, and the next. The park rang with the metallic bong of cricket ball on drinking fountain. Jacob's whoops resounded high and low. At last, Kitty threw down the bat. This isn't fair, she cried. You've waited the ball or something. It's called sheer skill. My turn. One more go. All right. Jacob tossed the ball with an ostentatiously gentle underarm throw. Kitty swung the bat with savage desperation. And to her vast surprise made contact so firmly that she jarred her arm up to the elbow. 
Yes, a hit! Catch that one if you can. She began a dance of victory, expecting to see Jacob pelting off across the lawns. But he was quite stationary, standing in an uncertain posture and gazing up into the sky somewhere up behind her head. Kitty turned and looked. The ball, which she had contrived to swipe high up over her shoulder, plummeted serenely out of the sky. Down, down, down. Behind the wall, out of the park, and into the road. There followed a terrible smash of breaking glass, a squeal of tires, a loud metallic crump. Silence. A faint hissing sound from behind the wall, as of steam escaping from a broken machine. Kitty looked at Jacob. He looked at her. Then they ran. Hard across the grass they went, making for the distant bridge. They ran side by side, heads down, fists pumping, not looking back. Kitty was still holding the bat. It weighed her down. With a gasp, she tossed it from her grip. At this, Jacob gave a gulping cry and skidded to a halt. You idiot! My name's on it! He darted back. Kitty slowed, turned to watch him pick it up. As she did so, she saw in the middle distance an open gate in the wall leading to the road. A figure in black limped into view. It stood in the center of the gateway, looking into the park. Jacob had seized the bat and was coming on again. Hurry up! She panted as he fell in alongside. There's someone! She gave up, hadn't the breath to speak more. Almost there! Jacob led the way past the edge of the lake, where flocks of wildfowl squawked and plumed out in fear across the water. Under the shadows of the beech trees, and up a slight rise towards the meadow bridge. We'll be safe. Once we're over, hide in the craters. Aren't far now. Kitty had a strong desire to look behind her. In her mind's eye, she saw the figure in black running after them across the grass. The image gave her a crawling sensation down the skin on her spine. But they were going too fast for it to catch them. It would be all right. They were going to get away. Jacob ran up onto the bridge, Kitty following. The feet pounded like jackhammers, sending up a hollow clattering and humming of vibrating metal. Up to the top, down to the other side... Something stepped from nowhere onto the end of the bridge. Jacob and Kitty both cried out. Their headlong rush came to an abrupt halt. They stopped dead, crashing hard against each other in their supreme instinctive effort to avoid colliding with the thing. It stood tall as a man, and indeed carried itself as if this were so, standing upright on two long legs with arms outstretched and fingers clasping. But it was not a man. If anything, it looked more like a horribly distorted kind of monkey. Oversized and very stretched. It had pale green fur across its body, except around its head and muzzle, where the fur grew dark green, almost black. The malevolent eyes were yellow. It cocked its head and smiled at them, flexing its tapering hands. A slender ribbed tail threshed behind it like a whip, making the air sing. For a brief moment, Neither Jacob nor Kitty could speak or move. Then... Back! 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 This was Kitty. Jacob was dumbstruck, rooted to the spot. She grasped the collar of his shirt and pulled him, turning as she did so. Hands in pockets, tied tucked neatly into a moleskin waistcoat, a gentleman in a black suit stood blocking the other exit from the bridge. He was not the slightest bit out of breath. Kitty's hand remained clawed in Jacob's collar. She could not let him go. She faced one way, he the other. She felt his hand reach out and, scrabbling at the fabric of her t-shirt, clutch it fast. There was no sound but their terrified breathing and the swishing of the monster's tail through the air. A crow passed overhead, calling loudly. Kitty heard blood pounding in her ears. The gentleman did not seem in a hurry to speak. He was fairly short, but stocky and of powerful build. His round face had, at its center, an uncomfortably long, sharp nose, and, even in these moments of abject terror, 
suggested to Kitty something of a sundial. The face seemed without expression. Jacob was trembling at her side. Kitty knew he would not speak. Please, sir, she began hoarsely. What do you want? There was a long pause. It appeared as if the gentleman was low to address her. When he did, it was with terrifying softness. Some years ago, he said, I purchased my Rolls Royce at auction. It was in much need of repair, but even so, it cost me a considerable sum. Since then, I have spent a great deal more on it, fitting new bodywork, tires, engine, and above all, an original front windscreen of tinted crystal to make my machine perhaps the finest example in London. Call it a hobby for me, a small diversion from my work. Only yesterday, after many months of searching, I located an original porcelain number plate and affixed it to the bonnet. At last, my vehicle was complete. Today, I took it out for a spin. What happens? I am attacked from nowhere by two commoners' brats. You smash my windscreen. You make me lose control. I collide with a lamppost, destroying bodywork, tires, and engine, and shattering my number plate in a dozen places. My car is ruined. It will never run again. He paused for breath. A fat pink tongue flicked across his lips. What do I want? Well, first I am curious to know what you have to say. Kitty looked from side to side in search of inspiration. Um, would sorry be a start? Sorry. Yes, sir. It was an accident, you see, and we didn't... After what you've done, after the damage you've caused, two vicious little commoners. Tears studded Kitty's eyes. That's not so, she said desperately. We didn't mean to hit your car. We were just playing. We couldn't even see the road. Playing in this private park? It's not private. Well, if it is, it, it shouldn't be. Against her better judgment, Kitty found herself almost shouting. There's no one else enjoying it, is there? We weren't doing any harm. Why shouldn't we come here? Kitty, Jacob croaked. Shut up. Nemades, the gentleman addressed the monkey thing on the opposite side of the bridge. Come a step or two closer, would you? I have some business I wish to take care of. Kitty heard the gentle tapping of claws on meadow, felt Jacob cringing at her side. Sir, she said quietly, we're sorry about your car. Truly we are. Then why, said the magician, did you run away and not stay to admit responsibility? A small, small sound. Please, sir, we were scared. How very wise. Nemades, I think the black tumbler, don't you? Kitty heard a cracking of giant knuckles and a deep, thoughtful voice. Of what velocity? They are under average size. I think rather severe, don't you? It was an expensive car. Take care of it. The magician seemed to feel his part in the matter was concluded. He turned, hands still in pockets, and began to limp off back towards the distant gate. Perhaps if they could run, Kitty dragged at Jacob's collar. Come on! His face was a deathly white. She could scarcely catch the words. There's no point. We can't. He had loosened his grip on her now. His hands hung hapless at his side. A tap-tapping of claws on metal. Face me, child. For a moment, Kitty considered letting Jacob go and running herself, alone, down off the bridge and away into the park. 
Then she despised the thought, and herself for thinking it, and turned deliberately to face the thing. That's better. Direct frontal contact is preferable for the tumbler. The monkey face did not seem particularly full of malice. If anything, its expression was slightly bored. Mastering her fear, Kitty held up a small, pleading hand. Please, don't hurt us. The yellow eyes widened. The black lips made a rueful pout. I'm afraid that is impossible. I've been given my orders, namely to affect the black tumbler upon your persons, and I cannot reject this charge without great danger to myself. Would you have me become subject to the shriveling fire? In all honesty, I would prefer that. The demon's tail twitched back and forth like that of an irritated cat. It bent a leg and scratched the back of the opposite knee with an articulated claw. No doubt. Well, the situation is unpleasant. I suggest we get it over with as rapidly as possible. It raised one hand. Kitty put her arm round Jacob's waist. Through flesh and fabric, she felt the jerking of his heart. A circle of billowing gray smoke expanded from a point just in front of the demon's outstretched fingers and shot towards them. Kitty heard Jacob scream. She had just enough time to see red and orange flames flickering in the heart of the smoke before it hit her in the face with a burst of heat, and everything went dark.